to this talk on Chaos Zone TV. This talk, the rise and fall of social bot research, um, will be presented from Florian Galwitz. Um, Nochmal für die deutschen Zuschauer und Hörer, dieser Talk wird übersetzt. Schaut nach der Übersetzung. Ich werde nun zurück nach Englisch wechseln. I will switch back to English now. Um, um, this is um, a talk uh, presented by Florian Galwitz from the Nuremberg Institute of Technology and he will talk about social bots. In recent years, we have all observed the phenomenon of social bots um, accompanying different media events. And also the media had like waves also showing those social bots um, activities in the social media. Um, four years ago already, um, Michael Kreil um, found significant shortcomings um, in the research on social bots and um, Florian will now deeper show us why the current research is flawed or even deeply flawed in this specific field. So have a lot of fun in the talk, the rise and fall of social bot research. Thank you very much for the introduction. So unless you've been living under um, rock somewhere in the desert, you have uh, seen um, headlines like these. I just randomly selected a couple of headlines through Google News. So um, we um, have been told that um, uh, bots on Twitter are amplifying conspiracy theories or they are spreading disinformation before the election or they even half of the accounts uh, tweeting about the coronavirus are likely bots and bots are um, a major source of climate disinformation and um, they um, um, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of them and they even interfere in Canadian politics and in British politics and uh, Donald Trump has millions of bots um, uh, supporting him and they are a danger to democracy and they are poisoning democracy and they are damaging democracy. Um, they supported Boris Johnson and they are spreading fake false claims about the bushfires in Australia and they are even trying to influence uh, uh, um, uh, elections in Germany maybe. So um, this is a uh, um, uh, you will find hundreds of um, headlines like these uh, um, if you just uh, search for the keyword bots in Google News. Um, the, behind a lot of, many of these headlines, there is some academic research, most famously the paper by uh, Ferrara and colleagues called The Rise of Social Bots, which inspired the title of uh, this talk. And... Um, well, they, um, the research, the papers that uh, uh, claim to um, uh, prove some influence of social bots on the US presidential elections and the spread of fake news by social bots. And this is a paper, one of many papers by Philip Howard, who claimed that um, bots had interfered into the Brexit referendum. But there are many other issues that are allegedly um, influenced by social bots. So, for example, um, health communication vaccine, the vaccine discussion. This is a paper from 2018, so before the COVID pandemic. Uh, and um, uh, this is a more recent paper. Um, both claim that bots are interfering the discourse about vaccines. But they're also interfering the discourse um, about climate and generally um, any low credibility content on Twitter is allegedly um, spread by social bots. So uh, by the end of this talk, you will um, hopefully learn that um, the low credibility content is actually inside these papers. So um, uh, what's a social bot? Um, if we look at a uh, one of many slightly different um, 
definitions. This is one by, by Ferrara. So he's the one who uh, basically created the social bot hype. So we have to believe him. So if we listen to him, social bots are automated accounts that use artificial intelligence to steer discussions and promote specific ideas of products on social media, such, uh, such as Twitter and Facebook. To typical social media users browsing their feeds, social bots may go unnoticed as they are designed to resemble the appearance of human users, and they behave online in a manner similar to humans. So that's a pretty um, clear definition of what social bots are supposed to B, um, if, uh, uh, basically, if you uh, look at all uh, definitions of social bots in academic papers, um, this is a pretty precise picture of what the general consensus on social bots is. So typically, they are assumed to be political accounts influencing um, uh, political discussions, and they have to be automated, and um, they um, are accounts with human fake profiles pretending to be humans and somehow behaving in a human uh, fashion. So obviously at the intersection between political accounts and uh, fake accounts, you would find human paid trolls, for example. So people who are paid to, uh, to uh, take part in political discussions. Also, you would, can easily find automated mm -hmm. Political accounts, so for example, the Fox News oh, feed it? is political and it's somehow automated, so automatically uh, newly published um, articles on the website, for example, um, uh, get tweeted on Twitter. So there's some kind of automation. So this would be automated political accounts. And of course, there are also, um, uh, or you can at least suspect that a lot of automated accounts uh, with fake human pro profiles are used with porn or crypto scams, so basically to scam individual users on Twitter. But social bots, they combine these three properties. Um, that's generally the idea of social bots. And uh, social bots are um, um, uh, at least attributed with a, uh, with a, um, with a, um, um, uh, they're, they're somehow, um, people believe that they are able to produce content on their own. So they're kind of somehow autonomous and um, uh, the, the, very often the, the, the words artificial intelligence um, are mentioned in context with social bots. So um, um, if Twitter is counted with, crowded with social bots, where the hell is one? That's the my starting point for my interest in social bots. So I felt kind of gaslighted. So um, media is telling me that uh, there are millions of social bots on Twitter, and I've spent almost a decade on Twitter, and I've never seen a social bot. So that's um, the point where uh, that got me interested. Um, I have a background in AI, I have, uh, in pattern recognition. I've been building conversational dialogue systems for many years, uh, which we, we call chatbot today. And um, uh, I've never really believed the idea that at the current state of the art, you could uh, build um, political bots that uh, could interfere in current political discussions, that, is, that seemed kind of strange and implausible to me. So if they exist, how do these things work? So I wanted to find one to take a look at the social, an actual social bots and I, uh, an, an actual social bot. And I started to search for an actual social bot in late 2018, so uh, three years ago. So since then, I've studied dozens of scientific papers, and media reports about alleged social bots. So basically, I uh, read all um, uh, uh, newspaper articles, uh, media art, media reports about social bots that Google News c could come up with in various different countries. And um, I've analyzed hundreds of Twitter accounts that have been accused of being social bots, for example, in newspapers where actual social bot accounts were named. And of course, I asked a number of social bot researchers for an example of an actual social bot. And I've performed experiments on uh, using the Twitter API, which in involved hundreds of thousands of accounts. Some of these experiments together with Michael 
Kreil, who uh, was mentioned in the introduction, who has been working on this problem uh, 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 one or two years longer than me. So um, the total number of social bots I found until now using all these different approaches is zero. So I couldn't find a single social bot that fits the definition of Emilio Ferrara. So that seems kind of strange. So um, where does this apparent mismatch come from? In order to understand this, you have to take a look at the um, uh, uh, methodological, uh, methodological basic uh, basis of all these scientific papers. Um, and basically, it uh, boils down to two different methods. The first method is the so-called Oxford criterion, named after uh, uh, the uh, University of Oxford, Philip Howard, um, who um, uh, defined heavy automation as accounts that post at least 50 times a day. So basically, uh, he counted uh, the, the tweeting frequency of different accounts. Everybody who tweeted more than 50 times a day was defined, uh, heavily automated, and referred to as a bot. So that seems kind of strange. And the second approach, and the more common approach uh, nowadays, is um, an automated tool called a botometer, um, which is, uh, you can use it, there's, there's, there's a public website where you can enter a Twitter account and press a button, and then you get a score somewhere between zero and five, or between zero and and one, depending on, on the scale you use. And it, it basically, and and uh, um, the researchers typically f use the API, they feed lo long lists of um, Twitter accounts into Botometer. For each account, they receive a bot score, and then they use a threshold, typically 50%, so 0 0.5 on a scale of zero to one. Um, and if the bot score is larger than 0 0.5, then they simply assume it's a bot. Are similar, there are similar tools that basically work in the same manner, but Botometer is by far the most popular tool of this kind. So in both cases, no manual checks are performed whether the accounts identified using these rather crude methods are bots or not. And even more interestingly, the names or the user IDs of these alleged bots are not published. You will won't find any bots in all these dozens of research papers. And if you ask the authors of these papers um, uh, for the actual bots, they are routinely routinely withheld. So they won't give you the data. They will uh, give you some flimsy excuses about data uh, protection laws and privacy, or they somehow de accidentally deleted the data, or they uh, didn't store the data, or whatever. So um, the, it, pretty much like uh, if you ask uh, the kind of uh, the dog ate my homework type of excuses. OK, let's take a slightly closer look at the way these um, researchers produce headlines. So, so that's basically a, a certain, a perfect recipe for, uh, for um, uh, creating a headline in the New York Times. So you um, decide which political issue you might be interested in, really. Um, you can, can come up with any topic you might be interested in. Let's say you're interested in gaming. So you you want to uh, find uh, create a headline about gaming and social bots in the New York Times. So what do you do? You um, look for gaming related uh, uh, keywords on Twitter, uh, and um, you identify accounts that um, that uh, tweet about gaming. Then you come uh, uh, come up with a long list of of user IDs, of uh, Twitter accounts um, that tweet about gaming. Then you feed them into Botometer, use your threshold, uh, 0.5, for example, and you uh, get a list of bots and a list of humans. And then the New York Times will publish a headline, researchers nearly half of account tweeting about gaming are bots. OK, so now skeptical people like me might want to take a look at the actual bots to verify your claims. So obviously, it's more useful to hide this data.
data. But um, journalists uh, don't seem to be interested in the actual bots. They have never questioned the validity, validity of these claims, even without looking at actual bots. So they will believe you and they will publish this in uh, the New York Times. So um, the first uh, criterion uh, that's used for this type of papers is the Oxford criterion, so the 50 tweets per day criterion. It's pretty easy to um, to uh, show that it's not very useful. So you find very um, uh, um, uh, uh, large Twitter accounts, uh, celebrities who tweet more than 50 tweets per day, like journalist Glenn, uh, Glenn Greenwald or um, um, Corey Doctorow, uh, who is a blogger and author with a very large following, or uh, Johannes Kars, for example, a German member of parliament who tweeted up to 300 tweets per day. Well, Donald Trump himself uh, tweeted uh, more than 50 tweets per day on six days uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 2020, uh, So, um, or in, uh, at least uh, in a very short period of time in 2020. So. And political activists who have more time than presidents or member of parliaments obviously tweet a lot more. Uh, my favorite account on Twitter is actually a guy called Eric Luxak. He's a Canadian engineer and retired college instructor. He has uh, uh, been tweeting uh, at rates above 300 tweets per day over a period of several months. And he's always ranting about liberals in Canada and he, he hates Justin Trudeau. Um, Another interesting experiment I performed with uh, with uh, uh, was about the K-pop band BTS, extremely popular, and um, a German radio reporter made some derogatory remarks about the bands and the the K-pop band, uh, uh, the uh, the BTS uh, uh, fans were extremely angry about this, and um, uh, they created more than three million tweets in a period of four days with the hashtag Bayern 3 races. Bayern 3 is the uh, the um, radio program um, involved. And um, they, um, 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 so uh, 500 of those accounts, 500 different accounts, each of them uh, fulfilled the Oxford criterion. And um, the maximum was 344 tweets on average per day, and I looked at the top ranking um, accounts in uh, this list, and none of them showed any signs of automation. Thought they were real people. They were uh, they were sh uh, tweeting pictures of themselves, and they, uh, the, everything was con consistent. Uh, they're coming from different countries. So those are real people, not bots. Um, Another easy uh, way of, uh, uh, of the second criterion was criterion that's often used for uh, bot research is the Bottometer. Um, Bottometer, you can try it. Uh, the, the link is given at the bottom of the page. Um, um, and you can simply enter uh, the name of a Twitter account, and the Bottometer will return a score. So, for example, um, so those are all bots according to Bottometer. So, for example, Tim Cook is a bot. Uh, the Pope is a bot. Uh, the new German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, is a bot. Uh, former um, chess world champion Gary Kasparov is a bot. Uh, Auschwitz Museum is a bot. Um, Joe Biden is a bot. Um, the Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, is a bot. The um, very well-respected German virologist, um, Christian Drosten, is a bot. But also his counterpart, uh, uh, econo economic, a retired economist, um, who is basically, who doesn't believe in, in the coronavirus, uh, um, he, he um, is also a bot. So um, basically, if you just randomly enter account names, chances are very high that you will run into bots, according to Bottometer. Um, a similar um, analysis had been performed by um, Michael Kreil in 2018. Um, he fed all the uh, Twitter accounts of um, members uh, of US Congress into Bottometer. And um, you can see that basically it's a it behaves like a random number generator with a normal distribution pretty much around the threshold that's usually used for, um, for uh, uh, discriminating between bots and humans. So um, um, if we want to use the same approach 
um, uh, the the bot uh, the social bot researchers use for identifying uh, bots. We can find interesting stuff. We could find UFOs, or uh, we can f find any kind of uh, uh, of stuff we want to find. Um, uh, and I want to show how we could find unicorns. Let's uh, say we want to find uni uh, we want to find unicorns in Africa. So we would train a kind of photo trap. Um, for uh, unicorns, and um, and we want to deploy that in the Serengeti to find actually unicorns. So for training the unicorn, we have the same problem the social bot researchers have. Um, we don't have actual unicorns to train our um, uh, our classifier on. So we would use unicorn-like um, animals, like a white horse, for example, or we would use toy unicorns. Um, as, a, a, as a training set for unicorns. And we would use some other animals like a cow, a pig, a cat, and a dog as non-unicorns. And then we would, would train our classifier on this data. And then we would move our um, uh, trained classifier to Africa. And then um, we would uh, find uh, lots of Unicorns. So, for example, in this case, the zebra would get uh, rated uh, would get a seventy five percent unicorn score because it looks quite similar to this white horse, and the, also this white egret would get a very high unicorn score because it has this pointy beak and it's white, so it looks a lot very lot like a unicorn. So, no, if you want to convince people that you actually found um, lots of unicorns in Africa. Uh, some people might want to take a look at your pictures, but obviously that would uh, be bad for your uh, claim. So obviously you, you would want to hide the actual um, uh, unicorns. You would find you would simply uh, may, uh, rely on the results of your unicorn classifier. And people who who um, complain, you would tell them why well, we have almost one hundred percent recognition rate uh, in our uh, on our training data. So you believe us. That's exactly the way uh, the bottom eater people argue. If we take a closer look at how uh, this kind of classifiers work, well, basically, uh, the, uh, in statistical classifications or neural networks, or um, in the case of bottom eater, it's a, uh, it's a um, random forest classifier. Any, any of these classifiers basically places each of the observations in a feature space. So the dimensions might be the, the whiteness and the pointiness of the animals. And um, so the unicorns and the non-unicorns, uh, they form some kind of cluster in the feature space, ideally. Um, and the, uh, the training the classifier will create a class boundary that can perfectly um, discriminate between unicorns and non-unicorns on your training data or, or in very similar data. But in reality, if you now deploy your classifier uh, to Africa or to the real world, you would find lots of um, uh, unicorns and lots of non-unicorns depending uh, on the, the class boundary chosen by the classifier. So it would still produce 100% recognition rate on your, uh, on your um, uh, training data. But it seems a far stretch to believe that this is actually a unicorn or this is a unicorn. So if you now remove the training data, you see that's basically uh, you get some kind of unicorns, non-unicorns, depending on the class boundary you trained. But it seems outright ridiculous to believe that the animals labeled as unicorns will be actually unicorns, or even that the relative amount of the unicorns that result from this approach can serve as an approximation for the true prevalence of unicorns. But that's exactly the way the spot researchers argue. So there's another problem. If you think that what I told you so far is bad for social bot research, it's, it's even worse. Um, because um, uh, now you, I have to um, explain you some fundamental ideas of, of pattern recognition. Um, so um, in um, let's first uh, take a look at the approach. So we, uh, the, the idea people use to come up with claims like 50% or 15% of the accounts are bots. They feed the list into the, into the classifier, and they come up with five bots and eight non-bots, for example. And now they calculate the 
relative amounts of bots, like 38.5% in this case. Now they claim uh, that 38.5% uh, of, um, of the accounts are bots, which is uh, the so-called a priori probability for bots or the prevalence of bots um, uh, or the, the prior probability. Um, and uh, the, the fun part now is that this probability is already part of the decision process that's used by the classifier. So for example, a uh, um, uh, uh, random forest classifier like Botometer will include this probability and will learn this probability based on the training data. So uh, if, uh, if uh, the Botometer people use 50% bots and 50% non-bots to train Botometer, the classifier will have incorporated the information that 50% of the accounts are bots and uh, the optimal classifier with the lowest possible recognition rate, and that's, this is what the training process is trying to achieve, um, will always adjust the threshold in a way that it will, uh, will, um, will conform to this equation in order to produce good results on the training data or on similar. But this is circular reasoning. So uh, to estimate the number of bots using this approach, you have to know it beforehand. So this is, it doesn't make sense. It's simply impossible to use a statistical classifier to, uh, to uh, determine the prevalence of bots or of unicorns or whatever. In reality, in, if, with Botometer, um, uh, there's typically a curve like this. So depending on the threshold you choose, you get a percentage of bots that are classified, uh, a percentage of bots or a percentage of accounts classified as bots. So the standard th threshold many people use is 50%. But if the accounts of bots is, uh, the number of bots is too high to be credible, uh, the researchers typically choose a higher threshold, which would give you a lower percentage of bots. Uh, if you want more bots, you can choose a lower threshold. If you want to uh, want a uh, 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 few bots, you can choose a higher threshold. But so basically, the the uh, results the researchers uh, present are based on their guess of what an, uh, uh, the prevalence of bots might be in their scenario. So it's can uh, it uh, does not really make sense. So far, we have falsified the methodology used by social bot researchers using examples of human accounts fed it into the different method. And uh, also, we have shown that it can't even work in theory. So there's one secret um, that's remaining. What do the bots look like that these researchers claim to find in their studies? So the accounts they prefer to hide when we ask them for li the list of these accounts. And we've spent quite a lot of um, time trying to uh, get behind uh, uh, this question and to find out what do these act the accounts look like uh, they might find in their studies. So the first study we took a closer look at um, was about the German election in 2017. Um, the authors claim that the share of social bots among the followers of seven German parties increased to from 7 to 0.1% to 9.9% .9 during the election campaigns. So basically, they, they claim that uh, roughly 10% of um, 838,000 accounts following the largest German parties were social bots. So uh, more than 80,000 accounts uh, following German parties are social bots. That's interesting. So I asked the uh, first author, for uh, examples of actual social bots, and uh, he he gave me four accounts which didn't remotely look like social bots, so that seemed kind of strange. And he also seemed to be fully aware that there are no social bots uh, in his sample. So um, we uh, tried to replicate this study a couple of months later. So we basically we downloaded all the followers of German parties, and we fed them to, through a meter. We used the same threshold um, um, these authors had used. And we, for the first time, we had a look at the actual bots that show up in this type of study. So now we can look at, we found 260,000 bots. Um, we took a random sample from these, um, in this case, 199 accounts. I spent a lot of time looking at each of those uh, accounts very carefully. Um, those are, they are ranked by the bot score. So this is close to the 
uh, basically the maximum value um, a bottom meter can produce. And um, those are all the accounts. You can check them if you want, if you believe any of those are bots. We couldn't find any bots. Um, so for example, uh, a dance cafe in Erfurt, uh, uh, this guy here, uh, or um, we found a, a forest uh, in southern Bavaria, or this guy complaining about the uh, noise produced by motorbikes in Gelsenkirchen. And I, uh, it took me a quick Google search, and I could find out exactly at this day there was a motorcycle event in Gelsenkirchen at the at the Amphitheater in Gelsenkirchen. So they, those are real people with real ears uh, complaining about real noise. Many of these accounts are very inactive, so basically the opposite of what, what social bot researchers make you believe um, uh, about, the, uh, uh, about the properties of social bots. So we couldn't find a single social bot in this list. So some more of these accounts. Um, so for example, um, uh, probably Kyra Miller probably, she asked Microsoft for, um, for help and the, the one and only tweet, tweet she, all, uh, she produced with this account and it resulted in a bot score close to five, like 4.564, uh, so close to the maximum. Awesome. Um, a blogger, um, a doctor, um, a pol politician, a uh, former regional chairman of the political party, Die Linke, she got a bot score of 4.4 and a scale of 0 0.5. No bots. The um, second study we looked at closely uh, claimed that the, uh, they, they found uh, um, a, a, a very large a, a number of social bots in uh, vaccine, spreading vaccine critical information, kind of uh, 200,000 social bots. And I asked Adam Dunn, the first author for the list of the um, uh, for bots for uh, of his bots, and he actually gave me the list. So that for the first, very first time, we had the precise list that was used to produce this kind of paper. And also, again, um, we um, sampled uh, a, 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 sub, a, a random sample of 121 in this case of the 200,000 bots, and uh, I took a very close look at these 121 accounts, and we could not find a single social bot. And those are just nine of the 120 accounts I analyzed. Um, and you can see those are doctors. Uh, this is a, um, a very um, high-ranking um, uh, um, uh, doctor at the World Health Organi Organization, a medical student from Rwanda, uh, a professor from Texas. Um, he's uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, working at a medical technology company in Nigeria, a uh, medical intern um, from Saudi Arabia, a uh, health professional from California, I think, a postdoctoral researcher and uh, um, on RNA viruses, uh, data uh, operator, IT professional from India. So from people from across the, the world, many tweeting under the real name, many uh, with impressive professional credentials. And they simply, um, uh, these uh, social bot researchers simply claim those are all bots. So this seems kind of strange. Uh, so if we take a closer look at this list of 121 accounts, a lot, you can uh, check uh, the accounts, they're all in our paper. So for example, the World Association for Medical Law was rated a bot, or this pastor from Boston was rated a bot, but uh, um, uh, none of them seem remotely automated. This is one of my favorites. Taylor Timothy um, uh, tweets by a girl called Taylor who is seriously in love with a guy called Timothy Moss with whom she is engaged. So th those are two, two of her tweets. And um, the bot score is 4.39 for close to maximum. Oh, this Laura, J Laura James, um, she even tweeted picture, lots of pictures of herself. She tweets a lot about UNICEF. She was re-rated a bot. Okay, so um, uh, in uh, this year, two other papers came out, two other interesting papers. Okay. 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 
Okay, so there were some problems with the slides, but the uh, problems seem to be solved. So the, um, the, uh, I, in 2021, two papers were published um, where um, researchers used Bottometer and they actually checked uh, uh, the list of, uh, of bots they, they got, very much similar to what we actually did. And, we, and in this, uh, obviously, in this, in this paper, they took a very close look at 500 um, uh, accounts, and they fed them into Bottometer, and they also manually checked them if they could be automated or if they looked automated. And it turned out that Bottometer labeled uh, roughly 6% of the users as social bots, but none of them account looked like a re remotely automated. So they simply ignored the Bottometer uh, uh, labels as rubbish. And uh, another paper, very similar, um, it was just uh, the preprint was published a, a, a few weeks ago. Um, um, and they also use Bottometer. They use their uh, standard threshold of 0 0.5. And um, so 86 accounts were labeled um, uh, um, bots, but actually none of these was a social bot. Uh, uh, only one of them was automated. It automatically shared article from an external personal blog, so that, that doesn't make it a social bot. Uh, it, may, it might have been automated. So we ignore uh, the, the people uh, basically turned out that the bottom meter scores are uh, absolutely unreliable and have nothing to do with reality. So um, now we've seen, the, so basically we can ignore the um, existing social bot research based on, on uh, the Oxford criterion, or we can ignore the research based on uh, Bartometer. But there are some other uh, methods being used um, where people claim uh, to find social bots. So this is a headline from the Times of London, Army of Twitter bots follow top politicians such as Nicola Sturgeon and a few others. Um, and um, when you ask the there's no uh, the uh, the people how do you, how how do you know it's bots? Um, that is actually this guy. Um, uh, he, he he. Sorry. Okay, still some problems with problems with the slide stream, but hopefully I think uh, I won't change anything now. Okay, so the. Um, uh, this guy explained on Twitter how it worked. We downloaded the latest 1K followers of seven politicians and checked numbers of users with exactly eight digits in usernames. So these guys assume that uh, bots are uh, usernames with eight digits, like Mike26481564. So they assume that's a bot. Many people believe this, but it's actually complete uh, bullshit because uh, names like these are automatically assigned to newly created accounts by Twitter at least since 2017. So you can't, if you just uh, create a new account uh, with a common name, you will automatically get assigned a name with these age digits, digits attached. So uh, if you're familiar with Twitter, you would uh, you have a possibility to change the name of your Twitter account, but most people aren't uh, aware of this feature, so they simply um, uh, they look like bots for the rest of their days on Twitter. What about accounts posting the same stuff? Very often claims are made about bots um, with screenshot like the one on uh, like like this. So uh, different accounts posting more or less the same message. And uh, typically, those are so-called copy pastas, and uh, where people ironically make fun of some uh, uh, or a tweet they don't like by posting it over and over again. Sometimes they uh, um, uh, they uh, post it uh, over and over again unironically, or different account accounts post the same message. It's pretty hard to to understand if you're not familiar with the meme meme. Um, culture on Twitter. This guy, for example, he, all these accounts are on the same side of the discussion, but he doesn't get the joke. So he he believes those are bots. Actually, those are his friends in this in this uh, political issue. Um, and then you find reports like the one uh, that's yearly, published yearly by the Computational Pro Propaganda Research Project in the Oxford Internet uh, Institute, and they give you. Uh, colorful lists of countries where bots uh, had been 
identified um, uh, in the uh, in the year. Um, obviously, the the, um, the the whole list, if you look, take a close look, is not based on actual bots, but it's based on news reports about actual bots. So that's a kind of a um, um, in uh, a process that will continue to go on um, uh, forever because um, newspapers will report about this report and the reports about the report will be uh, will lead to further bot uh, uh, bots in uh, or bot uh, 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 claims in the newspapers. So um, uh, the best uh, there's a very nice claim by a German journalist in a very different context um, that describes what's going on. If I found an institute to combat public health hazards caused by hedgehog bites and provide this institute with staff positions, then I will get a study every year warning about the growing dangers posed by aggressive hedgehogs. Anything else would be rather stupid on the part of the institute's staff. So that's pretty much describes what's going on with all these um, uh, research institutes uh, um, involved in um, investigating social bots. So to conclude, social bot research is fundamentally based on the misclassification of human users as social bots. And malicious interactive social bots don't seem to exist at all. After years of studying the output of social bot research, we have yet to see a single credible example of a social bot. And some of the researchers involved in this type of research violate basic academic standards, though they make claims that are not supported by data and they withhold data um, that, which would allow us to verify their claims. And the public has been misled over the non-issue of social bots for years. So um, Michael Kreil and me, we published, all, we wrote all this down in a paper. Uh, the name is uh, The Rise and Fall of Social Bot Research. You can uh, download it at the link on the slide and you it, uh, it has all the lists of bots in the appendix. So you can take a closer look and uh, try to find social bots if you uh, in those lists if you if you like um, thank you very much for your attention well thanks so much florian and um, yeah for your talk and it seems to me that indeed the field of social bot research is in a very pro problematic state. Uh, to me, it also seems just for the sake of realistic thinking and discussion, um, the work you do and Michael Kreil is doing is really important for all of us. So we, and maybe you or all the scientists need to provide a clear base for discussion um, and media coverage such that those topics are actually kind of um, talked about reasonably. So we collected some questions um, from our audience mm -hmm. and um, maybe I'll go through these questions uh, one by one. The first one would be, um, yes, you talked about those social bots and like what is a bot and what is not a bot, but um, shouldn't the question rather be about the effect of such accounts uh, rather than whether they are click workers, people with too much time in their hands, paid influencers or automated accounts. So saying being a bot or being acting uh, in kind of those political ways or acting like a bot. Uh, isn't that actually the same or like the effect is important? Would you agree with that? Well, it's, um, uh, we are not the ones who made the claims that these automated bots exist. So first of all, before we talk about the effects of stuff, we would have to first have to talk, do they exist at all? There are many bot research can say, hey, but can, let's talk about the effects, not about the existence. Uh, because, uh, but first of all, we have got to rid of this belief, which uh, I think is, it's a it's a it's a conspiracy theory. It's a fairy tale um, that these social bots, these automated accounts, exist, and many people actually believe it. And typically, when people um, claim. Uh, you're a bot. You're no. You're a bot. Uh, this is your botometer score. No, I, I don't. I, I'm not a bot. But you're a bot. So these discussions uh, on Twitter keep going on, and they are based on this um, uh, uh, belief and this uh, ridiculous conspiracy theory. So. Um, 
first of all, uh, Michael and uh, me, we're trying to get uh, to make uh, get a, make uh, let people have a realistic view of what's actually going on on Twitter. Now, the uh, the question whether um, accounts are maybe um, paid by um, some malicious actors uh, uh, to it, uh, influence discussion is a very different question. So we we have been looking at uh, automation. I'm I'm a computer scientist, and uh, uh, so my my um, I'm not. Um, the right person to me to analyze the motivations why people might be tweet, tweeting on Twitter a lot, but my impression is that the very active accounts on Twitter, like the uh, the Canadian account I mentioned in the talk, Eric Lutzek, I don't believe he's a paid actor. He's he's a retired professor and he uh, engineer. He he, uh, he has a lot of money. He, he's, not, he, he's certainly not paid for being a political, very active on Twitter. He, he, he act, is acting out of intrinsic motivation. Same holds for all these 500 accounts that uh, uh, tweeted uh, hundreds of times about the about the the K-pop band. Um, they are not paid actors. They are people who really who are angry about stuff, or who people who are really trying to um, to 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 change things by being very active on Twitter. So my general impression is that people have a tendency of overestimating uh, the problem of. Uh, malicious fake accounts. People, uh, the default assumption should be actually those are real people with real, uh, real intrinsic motivation. Mm. Um, another question we have is um, in your slides you had this circular reasoning um, example or yeah. maybe this kind of f fundamental flaw of circular reasoning. Yeah. Um, and the question would be from this person, um, uh, is it maybe um, like circular reasoning, maybe not rather resonance, which, which would be a valid method to get a result, kind of um, that um, the results actually resonate with um, their, um, um, with the real world, such that uh, in the end you would kind of confirm that there is something resonating um, with your uh, findings. Um, it's a bit hard to ask this question, but maybe okay. you got it. Uh, I, I think I think I get I get uh, I, I believe I got get where the question is going at. So the, maybe the the idea would be to uh, so you, to start this to use this method, you would have to have a guess for the uh, the the prior probability of bots. So you could use this iteratively and hopefully end up and at, at the real value. But actually, I believe it will certainly uh, either it will uh, explode and go to 100 percent, or it will go to zero. From all my uh, let's say 25 experience in pattern recognition, I don't think that this uh, approach is remotely capable of estimating the real probability by using it, it, it uh, iteratively or something like that. So no, no, that I don't think that's that will work. The interesting part about uh, this. Uh, uh, this uh, equation is uh, any kind of classifier uses it. So uh, even humans use it. So if uh, if I have the uh, if my task is to label bots or whatever in a list of accounts, and I have some expectation of the real prevalence of bots, I will include this information. So how um, how uh, so basically the 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 problem is. Um, if we don't know the prevalence, can how can we even estimate it? And the only way to do it was uh, it would be if these two um, posterior probabilities, which basically tell us how much does the, do these features, um, uh, um, uh, uh, how much does these do these features? So, for example, the tweeting rate look like a bot, and if these two distributions are very different. So, for example, if bots tweet. 10,000 times a day and humans only tweet 10 times a day, then we keep we can keep these two apart. Um, and these two probabilities, which we don't know, are uh, very um, unimportant. But um, if these two distributions uh, look uh, are somewhat similar, so if so, think let's uh, think of try, we're trying to estimate if it's a man or a woman based on the on the on the height. Um, and uh, of, of course, if somebody is 1.75 meters, it can be a, a male or a female, it's very hard to discriminate. So these distributions overlap. And if these distributions overlap, we can simply cannot count 
male and females based on, without having uh, uh, without knowing in advance which uh, which uh, are the two classes uh, what the distribution is so um, this approach even if we uh, there's no way to make it uh, to iteratively use it uh, unless we have a very clear um, identifier for humans and bots. So, for example, if each, each of the bots has a label that says it's a bot, then yeah. we can discriminate the two classes. Mm -hmm. um, another question that is similar maybe to the effect question that we had in the beginning. Um, are you not worried that your research will be abused by those employing rooms full of humans to do bot-like posting to just claim there are no problems at all and um, just um, just just giving this as an excuse saying like ah, look at those researchers they claim there are no bots at all so um, like what we do is good work or something like that well first of all I'm I'm a researcher so I'm not interested in what people might uh, make of the results I have so I'm not trying to produce results uh, w uh, that might be useful for somebody or uh, I'm not afraid of uh, producing results that might uh, might uh, come handy for uh, parties in political discussions. The whole bot research often, very often involves um, um, uh, very um, polarized political discussions. So sometimes people like me because I, I tell the right wing people they're not bots, they're real people. And then in the next discussion, I tell the left wing people they're not bots and they like me because I tell them they're not bots. So um, at the moment, I start to think about uh, the uh, or the effects that some people might might like uh, about uh, research. Um, uh, this would be, uh, I would, would no longer be a, a scientist. But uh, obviously, we're not talking about people um, uh, uh, getting paid for for um, for uh, tweeting. So uh, obviously, we are only interested in the claims about social bots. So the automated accounts interfering in political discussions uh, using fake profiles. So the paid trolls, uh, I don't claim they don't exist. I know they exist, I've, especially in Venezuela, for example, or in Mexico or in Russia. They're very valid, um, uh, very credible um, reports about uh, paid trolls, even insider reports by people who have been working in this kind of setups. So I'm certainly not claiming that uh, there are no humans trying to, to interfere in political discussions. Yeah, um, um, maybe a follow-up from another attendee. Um, how can we incentivize um, this replication work um, for those studies you've uh, shown and you kind of tried to replicate as well, or at least got some information out within the scientific community for this field? Is there kind of something that the general audience can do or maybe something that researchers need to do in order to put more focus on uh, replication in this field, which seems to be a bit flawed and needs a lot of replication, it seems? Well, it's, uh, I think uh, the replication issue is a big issue in all scientific fields, even in computer science. Um, uh, a lot of the uh, research, um, for example, um, new topo topologies um, designed for neural networks, which work in certain setups in certain, uh, but it no longer work in uh, slightly different setups. Uh, so um, replication is a big issue in, in all scientific fields, but I think it's a very huge issue in social sciences. Social sciences. So I, I'm a computer scientist. I come from a technical field, we're uh, used to very strict standards. So we're used, uh, uh, we, nobody uh, would dare to publish something without being uh, ready to, to publish the raw data as well. So the idea of publishing results without uh, being able to hand out the raw data is a huge, uh, it bas it's basically scientific misconduct in our field. So in social sciences, obviously people seem to be a little bit more, more relaxed about about uh, reality and about truthfulness and about everything. So, um, uh, there, uh, I have a feeling there's a kind of cultural mismatch. Uh, they, uh, it turns out that a lot of uh, studies in social sciences are not replicable, and um, it, uh, the problem seems to be extremely um, uh, prevalent in social sciences. Yes.
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe last question. Um, uh, a couple of people asked the variations on the same question. In your opinion, is the lack of evidence for social bots su sufficient to prove that social bots do not exist or not in any meaningful amounts? I mean, like that we didn't find them doesn't mean we, they don't exist. I mean, we can build one for a proof that they exist. But uh, yeah. do you think that um, kind of the lack of evidence is um, proof for maybe that they okay, do the, not exist at all yeah, or so, not exist in, in, a, in a large quantity? Well, basically, um, uh, uh, the, the, the interesting, uh, maybe you're familiar with Russell's tea pot. Uh, he, uh, he used the, the, uh, the, the idea of a, uh, of a teapot um, uh, flying around the, uh, uh, around the sun in an orbit beyond Mars and um, um, claiming that the teapot was flying uh, around the sun in orbit around Mars is uh, hard to disprove. So you cannot, uh, you can uh, take a very close look at the orbit and you will still not be able to disprove that, uh, uh, that, uh, that a teapot is flying around Mars. And um, obviously we have the technology to send a teapot in an orbit around Mars. Uh, so, uh, but uh, um, it's, uh, and if people claim that a teapot might be orbiting Mars, uh, it's very hard. Yeah, we can build rockets, we can build teapots, um, we can send them in orbit around Mars and it would be uh, very hard to disprove these claims. Mm -hmm. It's very much like social bots. Now, I believe it's very unlikely that somebody has already launched a rocket with a teapot or to teapot to, to, to orbit Mars. And also believe it's pretty unlikely that people would try to build automated political social bots simply based on my understanding of the technology. Um, so building chatbots is extremely cumbersome, it's expensive, and the, the results are really, really bad. So if you've ever interacted with a real social, uh, a real chatbot, uh, you know that those uh, bots are very limited at the current state of the art. They can't even handle negation. So if you tell uh, Siri, do not uh, switch on the light, it will switch on the light. So even simple stuff like negation are still beyond what natural language processing can do at the current state of the art. So the idea that of rapidly coming up with a, a, a chatbot-like system that can interfere in current political discussions, which are usually only going on for a couple of days on Twitter, and then you would have to buy a new one for the next discussion, or you have to, to program a new one, it seems um, very, very uh, beyond what's uh, possible of, uh, from a te te technological perspective. So I'm pretty sure these kind of bots do not exist, but of course, I cannot prove it. All right, um, thanks. I think we got some more questions, but we cannot really fit them into this slot. Um, again, thanks so much, Florian. Keep up the discussion and also keep up your work. And um, after this talk, uh, we will continue here on Chaos Zone TV with a talk from Big Alex about um, software engineering, I guess. And we will see you soon um, after a short break. Thank you. Thank you.